Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Indy and Gary, for hosting this. This is, uh, I'm honored. Um, so I am Eric Meth. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Good Harvest. Uh, we are focused on the cannabis and wellness industry, namely from an advertising and data marketing standpoint. I'll get into that uh, in a little more detail later. I mostly wanted to introduce our panel. Um, I've got two awards to give out before we even get started. Uh, Tara Sargenti gets the award for longest standing panelist in the cannabis industry, uh, being 10 years uh, within the, 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 the cannabis space. Tara, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Hi, everyone. Thanks for, oh. there you go. Hi everyone. Thanks for having me. So um, 10 years ago in 2009, I invented the first brownie mix for herbal brownies. Uh, I worked with a food chemist from IFF and a pastry chef to develop an optimized mix that would use THC more efficiently. Um, after that, I made a YouTube video which went viral and got the attention of Spencer Gifts. After that, my mix was carried in 1,000 stores nationally. And since then, I've developed a CBD line and I'm currently taking the IP from that line and applying for a full cannabis license to make THC products. Um, aside from that, I am also the executive director of the New Jersey Canna Business Association. It's the state's first and largest cannabis trade organization. And uh, through that, I advised on our current medical marijuana bill. Excellent. Um, the next award, <laughs> uh, th this I call the Underachiever Award. I was a little confused on how I should address uh, Camel. Um, because he's an ER doctor, uh, a soldier in the U.S. Army Reserves, uh, and a CBD farmer. So depending on the topic that we're talking about, I'm either going to address you as doctor, lieutenant colonel, or farmer camel. Thank you. Uh, honored to be here today with both of you guys, and, and thank you so much, Indy uh, and, and Gary Virgi, for putting this together, and, and Jess Virgi and the rest of the board. Um, special shout out to Bistricha Law Firm, and to Baker Hostetler, Sonny's there too, uh, for, for supporting all our efforts in the CBD space. So uh, very, very excited to be here to talk to you guys about uh, the business opportunities that lay ahead. Excellent. So we're gonna, um, and that's me, I'm just a marketer. That's, that's, my, that's my gig. Um, so the, the main topics that we wanna get into, and we, we want this, it's not gonna be a slideshow, don't worry. We're going to make this very conversational. We also want you to be part of the conversation, so we'll definitely have time for some Q&A at the end based on the content that we go through. But we wanna really set the table with some of the legislative activities that are going on uh, within Jersey, within the US. Um, we wanna talk about some of the, uh, certainly the business and financial opportunities. Uh, we want to cover some of the health-related and, and medicinal opportunities that exist within the CBD and the cannabis market. Um, and then also talk about just some of the, the, the marketing side, just to make me feel better. Um, the first thing I wanted to get, just to get a sense of the room, anyone an active cannabis or CBD consumer? Raise your hand. It's okay. Safe space. Great. <laughs> um, curious about the industry? Everybody actively investing in the in the in the community in the in the industry. Great, good. Um, so, kicking off on the um, the legislative updates, is it, it, a lot of people following what's been going on to a certain degree. I wanted to unpack that a bit because it has been uh, a series of false starts, fits and throws, uh, getting almost to the end zone but pulling back at the one yard line. Um, so Taro, just being part of the uh, policy end, helping to write the uh, medical bill, which was recently passed, or at least the expanded port part of it passed as part of the Honig Act. Um, what are you seeing being that close to uh, the legislative component of the state right now? So um, we came really close on March 25th. We were anywhere between two and five Senate votes shy, depending on the day. So a lot of people thought that would be the turning point for the cannabis industry. Um, it, however, it wasn't, but on July 1st, we passed the Jake Honig Compassionate Use Medical Marijuana Act. And this really expanded access for a lot of our patients. It raised the amount you can possess, it added additional qualifying conditions, and it generally just made a lot of improvements to grow our industry in New Jersey. 
Uh, with this, we have released additional licenses and a round that just closed uh, at the end of August. So as the patient population since Governor Murphy has taken office has tripled, but to really have a thriving industry in New Jersey, we need adult use, which is, I guess, what everyone's concerned about. So the prediction there is we're going to make one more push in November and December to try and get this done. Uh, Governor Murphy and President Sweeney have agreed to work together. And in the event that it possibly could fail, then it would get pushed to a ballot initiative for next November, which it should go through extremely easily because it's a presidential election, so we'll have a great voter turnout, and we have right now over 60% popular support in the state. Great. So, I mean, just looking at the, the national level um, compared to what's going on in Jersey, outside of some caucus infighting, some holdouts on both sides of the aisle, um, reason that they're pushing things into November, December, mostly through lame duck session. Yes. Um, so comparatively on a national level, we are falling behind, which is pretty tragic because Jersey was poised to be the second largest market in the, in the country outside of California just earlier this year. Um, we were set to beat New York to the cannabis legalization race, which would have, in our state of 9 million, we also have 130 million people within one day's drive. So you're talking about an extremely vibrant market. But we lost that momentum to Ohio, and Massachusetts is certainly draining some of our uh, would-be consumers. So it's very important we get this done before we lose too much momentum, especially we have Canadian companies coming in, stealing some of our business. So people don't realize if we decriminalize, that just thrives the black market. If we stay in prohibition, we're losing tax dollars, and this is one of our only new streams of revenue coming into the state. And as this is the fastest growing industry sector in America now is surpassed technology, we're all missing out on the green rush if we continue this trend of prohibition. Yep, and um, I don't know, Kamal, anything on uh, some of the issues with um, municipalities blocking uh, the, the, the ability for businesses to open um, either dispensaries or grow operations. I know you have your, your grow out in Oregon, which is a little different. Also, it's a hemp-based grow, so you're fairly covered with the Farm Bill passage, and that's, I'm assuming, one of the reasons why you saw that opportunity. But with some of the issues, is anyone familiar with the term NIMBY? Not in my backyard. That's basically one of the issues. There's how many, Tara, there's 40, 52 municipalities in Jersey that are blocked uh, right now? We're over 60 now that have 60. banned. Right, so selective on where you can actually open a facility, but have you seen this in other markets as well? Yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's a common problem everywhere until it's not a problem, right? I mean, so uh, they've had uh, this same debate in every state before it legalizes. Right. And it, as soon as it legalizes, they realize, oh, wait, this is not really such a big deal. Right. You know, I, I uh, in fact, uh, I give it to my grandmother, you know, and I have my parents use CBD, and it's it's... It's life changing, you know, for the people that it helps. It, uh, uh, you know, it makes a huge impact in their lives. Now, what I would, what I would uh, like to point out is that, you know, there is a, a significant divide uh, between CBD um, and uh, marijuana, general marijuana. Um, the CBD industry is is uh, poised alone to be. Uh, uh, maybe a $23 billion industry in just a few years. Uh, so, you know, I joke to some of my friends, uh, and that, that's entirely separate from marijuana. I joke to some of my friends that, look, um, you remember that time in the late 90s uh, with the internet where even, like, stupid ideas made money? I said, <laughs> this that's exactly the time we're this in This is now. one of those times, right? Yeah, this is that time. <laughs> so... So, I mean, th there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. That doesn't mean that people have stupid ideas. Uh, but the, the, the point is that people need to get on board. And the more municipalities hold out, uh, you know, I, the worse it is going to be for our state. Can, can I add a little bit to that? Please do. Please add. Okay. So, um, one thing that people don't realize with that whole not in my backyard bit is this actually raises property value because if you look at Colorado as an example, 
Denver legalized the first year and Colorado Springs opted out. And they had a four year wait in between. And in those four years, Colorado Springs was looking over the border and they realized Denver got new roads, new schools. They had an influx of money into their municipality. And four years later, they couldn't wait to jump in. So when you have these improvements in your town, your property values all go up. The other things that happen is police forces take effort away from low level arrests and put them to actually real crime that's going on, as well as underage use goes down because it's not cool anymore when your uncle's doing it and there's no more taboo. So really we're talking about improvements across the board where if we just keep in this phase of prohibition, uh, I, I mean, it's just damaging to everything. And yeah, revenues obviously drive a lot of this and seeing benefits of those revenues, whether it's roads, schools, uh, that's a driver. So from a market opportunity, Kemal mentioned this, so right now, we're seeing about, a, overall, about a $40 billion industry. If you look at everything in aggregate, and that's including ancillary, that's including services that are attached to the industry, whether you're a, a, a lawyer, an accountant, a marketer, in addition to those that are actually growing, processing, and, and ultimately retailing these products, the retail component between adult use and medical in the US roughly makes up about 40% of that. We did about $9 billion in top line uh, in 2018. Uh, we're projected to do about 12 million this year, by the end of this year. And you see how the escalation is going over the next several years. Um, and the same holds true for the, for the CBD market. From a market growth standpoint, similar charts, you look at that combined annual growth rate, 14% over that time period. The only other markets that we've seen this through um, in the past, you look at basic cable, you look at home video, uh, you look at legal cannabis and broadband access is really the only industry that is outpacing the cannabis industry right now. Um, so the market opportunity is immense. Um, this alone is the CBD market opportunity. So right now it's about a $5, five billion dollar industry in the US. Um, by 2023, we're looking at an increase to about 24 billion. So good reason why you jumped into the grow. Um, now, on, on, on one other topic to mention on the on the investment side, this little bit of a mouse print, and we will distribute this um, at the end, so we can dig into these numbers. Uh, you can dig into these numbers on your own. This represents just the amount. There's a tracker, great tracker, uh, from a PE firm called Viridian. Every week, I follow this. It, it's it's my family thinks I'm crazy, but every week I get all excited when the Viridian tracker comes out because it shows the level of investment that's happening uh, currently right now. We just cracked, as of last Friday, $10 billion in investment in the space. If you look at that in comparison to where we were pacing last year, uh, we were roughly at about five and a half, six billion dollars $6 this time last year. Uh, so we're, we're almost double, more than double, 77% 70, 70, growth year over year. The year finished at $13.5 billion. That was almost a 300% increase over 2017 when $3.6 billion was invested. The other thing to take notice of is the size of those investments. It's almost tripled in the course of a year and a half. So the amount of private money, private equity money that's coming in is immense. It is still holding back a good portion of institutional investment. So this is a prime, prime time uh, for a lot of you that are considering investment to look at uh, what's right for you. I think understanding is most important and being able to dispel some of the myths which we'll get into um, is a thing that's driving a lot of this before a lot of this institutional investment starts coming in. And then lastly, the tax revenue benefits, uh, which, which we mentioned. Um, you're seeing it across the board, but this, this, is, this is what's represented. California last year, 300 million, fell, or projected by the end of this year to be 300, uh, Sorry, last year projected to, to, it was projected to do a little higher. It came in at about 300 million. But you look at the amount of tax dollars that are coming into this, this is another further reason why it's important to look at regulating an industry like this. Get products off the black market. No one makes tax revenue off of black market uh, products. And you have a, a lot of health issues that, that are existing, which we'll get into as well. If I could tag on to, sure. the, to the black market issue. Um, you guys are still eating, so I won't make it all that <laughs> horrendously disgusting. But, you know, on a good day, I'm an ER doctor as well. And, uh, and so 
one night, this is when I was back in residency, um, a guy came in just out of his mind. And he uh, was a young kid. Um, I say young kid, but he was in his early 20s. Uh, and he was, he was there in Patterson looking for marijuana. Now, what he got was something very, very different from marijuana. I mean, he, he got it from you know, some guy on the street. And so you, you know, when you do that, or when you create that type of market, you cannot regulate it. Uh, so uh, very routinely, these things are contaminated with harder drugs, you know, real drugs, you know, heroin, cocaine. Um, K2. And, and, yeah, and, and dangerous things. Uh, so, you know, that, that's why creating the opportunity within a, within a legal framework is the right thing to do. It's the way to keep it safe. And, and, and I, I can tell you from my experience as an ER doctor, nobody comes in from a marijuana overdose and dies. You know, that's just ridiculous. You know, the, the, uh, and, and there are people that, uh, that are on the other side of this argument that, that, are, that are coming in and testifying to, uh, you know, hearing some of which you may have seen here in New Jersey, that are saying, oh, my son or my daughter smoked marijuana and weed and died, you know, that's just, it's, it's offensive to me because it, that's, uh, again, uh, if they did, you know, it was probably because of some adulterant that was added to it uh, because, uh, again, uh, this is from CDC data. Uh, you can go on the CDC website and see um, last year there were over 30,000 pe people that died from opiate overdoses, uh, but zero people died from marijuana overdoses, and zero people died from CBD, right? So, so I, I think it's important to keep that in mind when, when thinking about this framework, you know? I wanna invest in this, but, you know, is it morally the right thing to do? Yes, absolutely it is the right thing to do because it helps people. This does not kill people. And, it, and there's a lot of data showing that it'll actually uh, help uh, patients get off of their opiates. Yeah, and I, I would say before we, I, 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 we have some more info that I wanna show on that. Before we get to that, one last part on, on the more federal legislative front. Um, we think it's going to be a while before we see any type of federal, full federal legislation. So putting that out there, it will likely take an administration change, probably another flip in the House or the Senate. Um, before we start seeing, because it will be everything kind of working in concert. We will see more states coming on board. We will see more tax revenues coming in, more regulation coming in, lowering of some of these issues that are happening in the general market because of these black market products that are on, 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 out there right now. But the things that are moving forward, there, there is movement in both bodies of, of Congress um, that, that is making some very good progress. And two, namely, two, two acts, namely one called the States Act, uh, which is strengthening the 10th Amendment through entrusting states. Um, the other is um, the Safe Banking Act, secure and fair enforcement. Um, both of these, while we can't, likely will not see any type of full federal legalization similar to what Canada uh, passed last year, um, this will also help open up the business opportunities. I think both of you can speak in, in different levels. I could speak a little bit too, but um, because you have both of these working in concert to allow businesses in these legal states act as regular businesses. They can get a bank account from a federally regulated bank. That's not possible right now. Sorry, I should say it is possible, but it's not being done. They're technically protected, particularly hemp, industrial hemp derived businesses, but they're still not doing it. So I know Tara, you've had countless number of issues oh God, that you can share is... with payment processing. Tell us a little bit about that. A decade of nightmares. Um, so I have been banned from PayPal, from Square, from Stripe, from Amazon. I have been shut down by alternative payment sources, such as Elevon. I've had my bank account closed twice. Um, one time my funds held for 180 days, the other times just shut down randomly and returned as a check while I was held by security in the bank. Um, I've also had my social media shut down three times and had to rebuild my followers from scratch. So it's been a long, hard journey, and I've been sued twice. But 
it's gotten a lot better in the past two years. So that's really good. Um, if the States Act or the Safe Banking Act come to fruition, that's going to help immensely. But in the meantime, we are slowly seeing participation. There's um, a couple banks that work with the organization I, I help run right now that are explicitly allowing cannabis accounts. So that is huge progress. And it's going to take more people coming on board and these laws passing to get the normalization. But we're on the right track now, and I only see it getting more positive moving forward. And, and come on, I mean, if you could share a little bit going through a, a capital raise for your, your yeah. farming operation. Yeah, so we, uh, you know, as soon as the farm bill passed last year, we said, look, you know, we have to do this. And so we, we put together uh, a $2.4 million raise to do a 220-acre uh, CBD-rich industrial hemp grow. And so now I've got, uh, uh, this, is, this is like earlier this year, I've got uh, uh, the prospectus out, I've got investors, they're ready to give me the check, and, and in some cases, some of them have sent me a check, and, um, and I still don't have a bank account. You know, and <laughs> we've, we went uh, literally to uh, over 20 banks, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I would go there uh, with the farm bill, right. and I would say, look, right here. this is the farm bill, and, and these guys aren't going to read it, right. so I would get the I would get the news article that talked about the farm bill, right. saying, "Hey, this is this is okay. This is legal now." Even Mitch McConnell said it is okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When we, you you know an industry is going to succeed when the Republicans get on board, right? <laughs> and so uh, that, that's why I know this is going to it's going to do really well. But so it, we we had um, very very difficult time, right. and then finally. We had found uh, a couple of banks willing to take, uh, you know, a risk, and uh, and and work with us, and so we, you know, luckily found a bank account and, you know, got our investors, and so 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 far so good. No, agreed. And I, I mean, I could speak briefly on, on my experience. Um, this is one of the advantages when you're in the ancillary side. Um, we are a marketing company, as far as Bank of America is concerned. So um, we. It, it, it does become uh, arduous in some cases, but with, within all that, you still saw the amount of capital that's coming in. So there are safe and secure ways to do that, and our representatives are doing their part to make this a lot easier for us. So, um, so changing gears a little bit, uh, we talk a lot about the, the myths that exist. Uh, people get addicted, this is a gateway drug, um, a lot of what I also want to address is a lot of things that you're hearing in the news about vape lung illness disease. Um, we've heard things that teen, in, teen usage increases. I mean, can we talk a little bit about um, what we see? I've got some, some figures to back it up, just so we're not reporting fake news here. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things with, with, um, with, with teen usage, where do, where do we want to start here? Yeah, that's a, these are all really, really good points that you bring up. Uh, you know, so to, to talk to your first, first point, the vaping issue, yep. uh, you know, we've had half a dozen deaths so far uh, that, that are uh, known to be directly caused by, by vaping. And then aside from that, uh, hundreds of people that have been uh, hospitalized and made sick from this. Now, you have to take this all uh, in context. You know, e even a single life lost is a ter horrendous tragedy, right? I mean, and then this is six people that have died. But six, anywhere from five to six million people vaped in this past year in the United States. And out of those five to six million people, six people died. And it's still tragic. And I think we still need to figure out what caused those deaths. We need to figure out how we can prevent it. We need to figure out, you know, who is the bad player in the market? Is it the oil that, that's being, that it's being mixed in? You know, certainly it's not the cannabis, right. you know, because again, as, as we've established, CBD and, and the other cannabinoids don't cause death. You know, even in, in large doses, they don't kill people. So it's, it's got to be something. A thousand years of clinical yeah. anecdotal data supports yeah, I mean, that. Yeah. I mean, it goes, <laughs> goes back to the, to the Vedas, uh, ancient Egypt, uh, and, and uh, 
uh, you know, ancient cultures all over the world have been using this stuff uh, for thousands of years. But, but so I, I, I think it's important that we, we, again, take it all into context. I can tell you that uh, Motrin and Tylenol kill people every year. All right, I shouldn't say sing, single out Tylenol, but acetaminophen and ibuprofen uh, kill people every year, you know, from liver failure and from uh, GI bleeds, uh, and a lot more than five or six people. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when people start talking about teen use, uh, child use, um, we have some very, very, gr very good data now that shows that in areas that have legalized um, uh, uh, teen use actually does go down. Um, and so, and that's what we've been seeing in our ERs as well. Um, uh. So um, with these vape carts, this one I, I particularly breaks my heart a bit because as I've looked at the evolution of this business, we have found such a safer way to consume. When you look at patients who maybe have uh, problems with their lung capacity, people suffering from cancer or young children, um, vaping has provided a much safer route of administration because you're not burning a, a combustion exit over 700 degrees. And at that, you release benzene, you release all a bevy of uh, carcinogens. Now, vaporizing operates at a much lower temperature, so it's actually much safer. The problem with this is, again, prohibition. Because when we have a regulated market, we have to comply with OSHA standards. We have to have regular inspections. The, um, the Marijuana Department of Health comes in weekly to expect, inspect these facilities. The cartridges we use will be surgical or stainless steel. Some of the cartridges we have now are coming in from in China, and they're just coated in a metal paint. And what happens to that paint? It leaches into your oil. If you're not regulating your plants, you have mold, you have pesticides, you can cut it with any type of oil you want. So these are the problems. And again, it all gets fixed by creating a regulated market. So that's why, and the media is spinning these vaping deaths to make vaping look like the villain, where really it's prohibition and a thriving black market that it drives. Um, and, and then to address what you said about uh, it being a gateway drug is a horrible myth because that was something that was created by the war on drugs, and it's really propagating misinformation. What we're changing the narrative to now is it's being seen as an exit drug, because we have an opioid epidemic, which I'm sure everyone's extremely aware of, and cannabis has actually helped people get off of opiates. So the language now is becoming that's an exit drug, not a gateway drug. See, on, on, and on that point, can you, I want to show that video. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, just exactly what you said, one of, I'm just going to set it up. Sure, please. Um, after I came back, you know, many of you know that I've, I've served in the Army, I've been in for 19 years now, and all my comments today are, are just my own. You know, I don't rep represent DOD or the U.S. Army or the <laughs> government today, so my little qualifier. Um, but when I came back from my deployment, we took care of so many soldiers that were you know, essentially zombified by their opiates and their benzos and their antidepressants. And one after one, um, so many of them came back to me and said, look, we got off of our opiates, our benzos, our antidepressants by taking cannabinoids or taking CBD. And so this clip is from one of my veteran buddies. Um, we, we did a program actually, uh, we were featured on the History Channel uh, for an innovation segment about uh, cannabinoids and CBD. Yeah, and apologies if the uh, sound is a little out of sync. <laughs> Nightmares, I started having issues with like, I couldn't control the volume of my voice, I was yelling at everyone. I came home from Iraq in 2008 the first time. My sleep started getting irregular. I started having nightmares. I started having issues with, like, I couldn't control the volume of my voice. I was yelling at everyone. Um, I wanted to fight everyone, and I couldn't figure out why. I'm either not sleeping at all because I just can't get to sleep, or when I do sleep, I'm trapped in a nightmare for the entire time, so I wake up completely exhausted. And so the doctor's first response was, take this. 
Now at this point, I'm in a sling with my arm because my tendonitis and bursitis in my elbow was so tight, I can't even open my hand enough to open to lift a coffee cup. I got a bottle of 300 milligram CBD oil. Three days after dosing twice a day, I was back in the gym lifting my full weight in the gym. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's one, one of countless stories. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a medical patient in New Jersey. I have gone through, thankfully, nothing overly serious, but surgeries and rehab. And the last thing I want to do is zombify myself with any type of major opioid. I mean, for a, for a long time, I was self-medicating. I decided to do it a little more properly, and it's, it's a game changer on so many different levels. Yeah, what we're seeing is uh, many veterans um, are, are using this stuff, like you said, to get off of their opiates and their benzos. And so uh, they're using it to get back in touch with life and with their families so they can be functioning adults again. You know, and, and we have, this is just one of hundreds and hundreds of testimonials that I've collected over the years um, from my, my friends and fellow soldiers. You know, the story is the same every single time that, hey, you know, just emotional, uh, uh, just thank you so much, this has really changed my life. And that's why I know this industry is, is going to outpace perhaps uh, any of the industries we've seen in the last 15 or 20 years, because it, it's gonna help people. It's not just, it's, it's not one of those things that's, uh, you know, that, that's being pushed out just for um, convenience, you know, this is, this is gonna be a game changer for a lot of patients and, 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 and people. I, I was just gonna say, I believe the number is um, 96 or 97 percent of US military support medical marijuana because of PTSD. Yeah, easily. Yeah, and this, this just gets back to some of Kamal's earlier points with the amount, and you look at it in comparison to alcohol-related deaths in the US, overall opioid deaths, and you start breaking down those opioid deaths into different classifications, compared to the number of confirmed deaths related directly to cannabis. Um, and again, a lot of this comes back to the federal legalization element, the regulation element. There are, and again, there's, there's some progress that's happening. Um, the F, the, the, um, uh, the, the government is now opening up um, proposals to expand the amount of research facilities. Right now there's one research facility in the US out of the University of Mississippi that is legally authorized to grow cannabis for testing and research purposes, one. And most researchers who get product from that research facility say it does not have enough active compounds, enough THC percentage, CBD percentage to be worthless to, to really conduct any meaningful studies off of it. So thankfully, they are opening up that to more uh, research facilities. NJCBA is getting involved with Stockton University and a few other New Jersey universities uh, to put educational programs in place that students can study and become part of this movement that's happening uh, as a lot of these different parts and components come together. That's when you start seeing, that's when you start addressing it with veterans because the VA cannot issue any of this right now. Uh, the uh, veterans can go and talk to the VA about this but uh, some veterans have actually lost their benefits right. over this, and, right. and it's, it's, a, it's a shame. Um, you know, you talked about uh, markets, and uh, one of the interesting things I've found, uh, you know, over the years uh, being sort of an advocate is that not all hemp is the same. Right. You know, and so the run-of-the-mill hemp, uh, generic hemp that's been grown uh, in the U.S. and all over the world, only has about 3% CBD. And that's, that's typically what's being grown in uh, most parts of the world, uh, in Europe. Um, the United States, um, you know, we're always special, right? So uh, uh, the breeders in the United States have created uh, uh, high, uh, plants that, that push out very, very high CBD percentages and other cannabinoids. Um, so we're looking at CBD percentages in the U.S. plants, uh, certain plants of over 15 and 20 percent. And so when you go to markets uh, in, in Europe and other places of the world, they, they want U.S. Uh, 
uh, U.S. Uh, hemp products because they know it's concentrated. They know it's a good quality. And the United States is on the upswing. You know, uh, we will become the world's largest uh, hemp manufacturer. It's, it's a matter of time. And it's, I think, only a few years till we get there. Yeah. yeah and I mean, and, and, and tacking on to that, um, the level of edu consumer education that needs to happen and continues to, 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 to happen right now, um, a lot of it still is tied into this, this legislative issue that exists. Um, same way that there's um, higher concentrations of CBD, um, people react to that a lot differently. So when you're talking about clinical studies, all three of us are going to react differently if we have the same dose from the same strain because our endocan everyone's endocannabinoid system is going to react differently and that's where this importance of clinical data and clinical studies. There is a lot happening, which is good. It's just not being authorized by the FDA, for instance. Um, the FDA is getting involved at a higher level now. They are starting to put different types of regulations, at least around health claims, and which becomes important when you're trying to market and educate uh, consumers who you're ultimately looking to get this product into the hands of. Uh, but we still have a ways to go. But w with every step forward, we take a little bit of a step back, but there is progress being made. Um, but getting into, so, so on, that, on that topic, so we'll talk a little about the, the, the marketing and the branding side, um, a little selfishly on my side. But um, it is important because I think there's a few things that have to get undone. We have about 80 years of prohibition, 80 years of bad press, lots of years of partnership for a drug-free America, which, don't get me wrong, it is a, the, the root of it is, is sound. Um, the effect of it went a little too far in the other direction, which is basically what got us into prohibition in the first place. It, prohibition for, for cannabis was pretty much a racially driven issue. Um, and it just continued to get compounded, which has put us into this position that we're in. Um, and then you lay on, God rest her soul, Nancy Reagan, with her initiatives, um, it just continued to reinforce this stigmatization of the drug, of, the, of the, 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 this wellness product that exists right now. Um, so, you know, Tara, you could speak to this. You, you, you're, you're, you're now Tara Sargente. You, you were <laughs> Tara Misu years ago. Yes. So 10 years ago when I first got into this, my lawyer said, uh, maybe don't use your real name. <laughs> So, um, and I had a much different look about me. I actually had dreaded hair and, um, but actually at that point it was still marketing because if I walked in the way I'm dressed today or wearing a suit, they would have kicked me out of there and thought I was a cop. I mean, that just was not acceptable in the culture of cannabis and what it was 10 years ago. It was a much different world. Now that conversely, if I walked in with Dred's and tie-dye t-shirt, they're gonna kick me out of the convention again because now everyone is, you know, businessmen and investors and politicians. So I actually got some advice recently that said, Tara, you're, you're in a professional environment now, you're talking to these important people and you're a dessert. Um, so they said, you know, it's, it's time to start using your real name again. So this is, has been an evolution I've actually experienced firsthand, but it, it's very welcome because my, my background actually is in design and marketing, and I love the new direction this is taking where everything doesn't have to be green and have a leaf on it. So, uh, and it, it really appeals to a broader audience where now we can target brands to men, to women, to children, not to children, to... Uh, <laughs> Well, unless you're making a medical product for epilepsy, then yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, why not? But uh, to pets, even, there's a great promise with people who say their dog couldn't walk to the food dish, and now it bounds up the steps. So we've really just seen such an amazing evolution. Yeah, and I mean, I've seen that. I tried to throw up a couple examples. So um, left side is Tara Misu, right side is Tara Sargente. Um, these are really good examples, um, and there's many more, but when you look at the evolution of brands, I mean, the reason that I transitioned my experience from traditional shopper marketing, traditional retail marketing, uh, data-focused marketing, was because this is a CPG industry. That's the way I view it. That's the way a lot of other individuals view it. It's a product that has to communicate a certain value, which is going to make you purchase product A versus product B, either when you're in the store 
or you're going to hear an ad on the radio, you're going to hear an ad on, on television, you're going to see an ad on your mobile phone. That's all part of this process. It's also part of the education process. Um, so now you're seeing very, I mean, beautiful based packaging um, that is evoking a certain message to the consumer um, between brands like Dosis at the bottom, which is a little hard to make out, but most people, most consumers, I should say, aren't very in tune with strains. Um, if anyone can name three Indica, three Sativa, and three hybrid strains, um, drinks are on me for the rest of the night. Um, what they do know is the effect. So Dosis um, goes for calm. Go, uh, they go for relief. They go for sleep. What do you want this thing to do for you when you consume it? Very simple, very elegant, tells you what you are going to feel. That's where the successful brands are, are making their mark, and it's also helping with this uh, consumer experience and this consumer education. Um, and this is the perception versus the reality. The old school consumer, uh, the stigmatization, the stoner, the dreads, um, the Spicoli element, um, and the new school consumers. There are very successful functional individuals who are cannabis consumers, that are moms, they're dads, um, they're professionals. That's who we're marketing to. That's who CPG manufacturers market to every day, uh, and that's the direction that we see things going. You know, when uh, another thing to consider is when we're saying consumers are coming in and, and using this stuff, over 80, in some markets, over 80% of them are taking it in as oil or other edibles. Uh, a very small and shrinking portion of the market is actually smoking it. You know, right. so I know there's a stigma that's, you know, that's been attached to smoking and all this other stuff, but but most of the market, uh, especially all over the country, uh, in places where the market's already established, uh, people are are consuming it by by through via edibles. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that's that's when when you look at some of the data. There's a lot of data that exists in the market. There's companies like Headset, BDS Analytics. They are providing that level of, of uh, data and analytics and insights so cultivators can understand what should I grow and how should I process it based on where I'm going to distribute it. If it's a market that is more in tune with flower consumption because it might be relatively new because that's what most people are used to. If you are being re-indoctrinated into the product because you're now finding yourself in a legal market, you usually crush it up put it into your preferred consumption method, a joint, a bowl, whatever it is. But there's so many different ways, there's so many modalities, there's so many different methods of consumption that are either more discreet or they'll have a different impact on you. I mean, these, this is the direction. And a company like MedMen, sure most have heard, if you have Sirius Radio, they advertise all the time, uh, or if you've gone into any legal market that they're in, they've done a very good job um, m with the destigmatization effort. Um, they actually tried to trademark cannabis, which I give them a lot of credit for. I don't think they got it, but they tried to do it. But it was turning it, turning the, the consumer perception away from calling it weed, calling it ganja, calling it, it's cannabis. Like, let's give it a proper uh, nomenclature, let's call it what it is, um, and be proud that you're a MedBend consumer. They put their packages, when you buy something at one of their stores, beautiful bags red bag with a big white MedMen logo as you walk down Rodeo Drive uh, in California. Be proud that you're a cannabis consumer. That's basically what they're trying to permeate the market with, which I think is a good thing. And a couple other quick examples and then we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over because I definitely want to get to some Q&A. But Charlotte's Web Hemp, another um, popular brand, um, also doing well if you're interested in investing. Um, same type of approach, very elegant packaging, um, they do a lot on social media, tied into a lot of influencers. Uh, Huxton is a lifestyle brand um, that's done very well in, in, in a couple key markets. But this is, this, this is the new face of cannabis. This is what you, as Jersey starts to get into more, uh, hopefully our legalization efforts uh, increase, this is what you start, this is what you will start seeing in this market. This is what you typically see in markets that have legalized, that have definitely changed the face and helped identify their products a lot better with the consumer base that's out there. Anything to add before we turn it over? That's great. 
All right. I have a question. Yes, please. Do we want to get a mic out there? Or are we... Hi, my name is Vinay Mahajan. Of course, I'm not a man from this industry. I'm from IT. Okay. My question is very straightforward. Every industry says it is good, right? But how do I believe that industry, right? So from that angle, there are, you know, some regulating agencies, like FDA is the one. I believe in a drug because FDA says it's a good drug, right? right. Not necessarily so also, but that's what we do, right? So what in this case for CBD industry, if FDA is not regulating, then who is regulating right now? And how do we believe it? You know, that's the question I have. You want to take that, Kamal? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, the FDA does not regulate the nutraceutical industry. How many people in here take vitamins? Right? I mean, a lot of you. And, uh, you know, you, you go to Jamba Juice and they tell you, oh yeah, take this, this orange juice because it's got a ton of vitamin C in it. Um, again, a nutraceutical. But none of that's regulated. Uh, so much of uh, uh, the products out there um, are not regulated. Uh, and, and that's part of the problem that the industry is facing right now because I think there needs to be some regulation. You know, we need to figure out um, you know, left and right limits of what's, what's appropriate to sell as a consumer, you know, consumer good uh, on a regular shelf and what should be labeled a pharmaceutical agent. We don't, we don't have those boundaries, uh, but those boundaries, um, I guarantee you, will be established, um, you know, maybe the next year, maybe the next two years. Um, and as to your question of, you know, how do we believe you, um, you don't have to believe me, you just, you have to read the hundreds, if not thousands, of testimonials of people that have taken it and that continue to take it. Um, I serve as medical advisor and scientific advisor to Warfighter Hemp. Uh, they create a CBD product. Um, I don't get any money from them, uh, but I do it because half of their profits go to veterans' charities. Um, and so it's a good company. It's clean. It's safe. But Warfighter Hemp goes through the pains of testing their products uh, three different times. They check for heavy metals, pesticides, and they check for, for concentration. They make sure that there's no other adulterants. They make sure that whatever they say on the packaging is true. Not everybody's doing that. And, uh, and that's really a shame, you know? And so you have to become, you have to be, as a consumer, you have to be very, very s uh, skeptical of whatever you're buying and whatever you're putting into your body, just like you would, you know, a vitamin. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose you could wait, you know, you could wait in six or seven years uh, until, you know, this all normalizes, but then your investment potential at that time is, is, is not going to be as great as what we're, what we're going to experience over the next uh, probably four to five years. Yeah, I think there's a lot, there's a lot to be said. Um, just as far as being a diligent consumer. And I mean, I, I can speak to experience. I always look for, if you can't find lab testing, certified lab testing attached, even if you're shopping online, steer clear. Go the other direction, find another place to purchase. Um, and e even within retail, live retail distribution, um, now you're starting to see more drug, big box drug stores uh, taking on CBD products. They're vetting it. And even to the point that a you know, well-founded company, multi-state operator, Cureleaf, they operate in, in New Jersey, uh, they recently came under fire because they, had a, they were starting to put, push the, the limits and blur the line on health claims. FDA slapped them with a $325,000 fine. Um, yeah, that doesn't help anyone's bottom line. And it just, it, not to mention, it's just not just the, the, the fine and the amount of the fine, it's all the PR and it's all the bad press that you have to deal with to clean up the mess. So, um, there's more to lose, and this is where this also gets back to know where you're buying your products from, especially products that you're putting inside of you. It, the, the, only, the only clinical and FDA-approved product that's in the market right now is from a company called GW Pharmaceutical. It's Epidiolix, which is predominantly prescribed for um, youth uh, with epilepsy. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, they, they do have the clinical trial of Epidiolex, which is a CBD, high CBD concentration drug for seizures, a very particular type of seizure. Um, but if you look outside the United States, if you look to Israel and Canada and other parts of Europe, uh, there are a, there's a ton of research. Um, yeah. And the problem is that the, the U.S. government will not necessarily recognize that. Right, and so we definitely need our own body of research, uh, but uh, you know, the, the Israeli government—they're uh, not going to allow their citizens to take something that they think is dangerous, right? So, if Israel and Canada and 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 so many other countries, you know, Uruguay, don't forget Uruguay. Yeah, Uruguay. <laughs> um, hell, this stuff grows wild on the streets of India, right? I mean, you could go to Punjab or anywhere. And, and it's in, in, it's in Pong, right? I mean, it, it's, it's been there. Um, and it didn't kill them. Uh, so, so uh, you know, that's not the argument. But, but the, the, the point is that this is a safe, you know, it's a, it's a safe medicine. And that, uh, you know, the opportunities uh, to invest, you will see today, you may not even see the same opportunities next year because the industry may have already outpaced you by then. And by that time, you know, instead of 50 and $100,000 investments, they're going to be asking for a million dollar investments. And that, you know, you'll get from private equity investment funds. Um, so I, I think uh, really the importance of timing uh, uh, is, is, cannot be overstated. Yeah. Another question. Yeah, that was exactly my question. Actually, how large do you think this window of opportunity is? Because people that I've spoken to believe that the, the big tobacco guys will finally move in and consolidate the market. And, you know, as they're doing with the vaping industry as well. So do you believe that to be the case? Um, I believe we're somewhere in the middle. I don't think at this point you're going to be an early adopter because if you look, uh, so California decriminalized in 1996 and a gray market sprung up and people love to call it the Wild West. It's absolutely not. It was 10 years ago. Right now there is a blueprint for success. You could do a case study on comparative businesses. So you're certainly not, you know, the first person through the door first to market anymore. However, we haven't reached a point of saturation. There's still many states that haven't even legalized. So when you're talking about major players come in, they can't do it on a federally legal and they can't do it on a national level. So we do still have a window somewhere in the middle to create these businesses coming from a place of experience, but not yet at a market that's thoroughly saturated. So even if these companies do come and start taking over the little guys, we're going to have the chance for buyouts, and if the cream rises to the top, you can position yourself very well right now. And that's, that's a lot of what's, you saw the, the figures, the investment figures. That's also inclusive of these, these multi-state operators, these MSOs. These are companies like MedMen and Cresco Labs and, and Cureleaf. They're all hedging bets. So to Tara's point, you can invest in an individual operation, a three-store location, a cultivation uh, and processing facility in Oregon, in Washington, in Jersey. All of these multi-state operators are putting the bet down that federal legalization will happen, and it's a, it's a cash float issue right now. What they're doing is, is trying to buy up as much. I hear at least once a week, uh, Ianthus just picked up this operator in Florida. Florida is one of the states that will likely start moving more aggressively forward on adult use. What they want is to have as much market penetration and as much market share uh, when this federal legalization happens. And that's where a lot of this opportunity comes in to get in on, not quite ground floor, but for second or third. I, I mean, I, I look at it in, 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 I'm a runner. I look at everything in distance. Um, we're at a 5K of a, of, a, of a marathon right now. So, yes. Thank you for a great presentation. I think uh, it's very informative to all of us, I'm sure. But just as a quick follow-up, so the three sides to the story, the way I look at it is the legislative angle, the consumer angle, but also the economic or the investor angle. And as a wealth manager, you know, financial planner, I, I ask this question all the time, does this belong in an individual's portfolio? If so, how much, to what extent? 
and what are the risks and rewards in the industry? So if you can address a little bit about both the private equity uh, investment as well as public equity, because as we've seen this year, there's been a tremendous amount of volatility in CBD stocks, both uh, the Canadian listed companies as well as the US listed companies. So obviously it's in its early stages and that's to be expected, but where do you see this maturing and what's the timeline? So I, I, I can kick that off. So, I mean, I, I could speak personally. I mean, I, I created my own fund of sorts within my personal portfolio. Um, between publicly traded companies on the CSX, publicly traded companies in the US that are tied to the cannabis space, there are plenty of opportunities for individual investors to get in. Um, you look at the, the Canadian stock index, the US stock index, it's very volatile, um, as you'd expect. But if that's the tolerance that you have, um, and that's a part of your balanced portfolio, uh, that's the way I look at it. I mean, I've got CPG stocks in there, I've got pharma stocks, I've got financial stocks, I've got cannabis stocks. I mean, that's, that, that's my balance. Um, I may have pulled my wings in a little bit going into startup mode, launching my own business, but um, for the most part, um, I, I typically keep that kind of balance. So I think that's always a good recommendation unless you have high, you know, larger amounts of capital to invest in a specific grow operation or, or put a much larger bet down on, on a private investment. Um, I don't have a ton to contribute to that. One thing I'll say is that when these stocks first started debuting in the past two years, a lot of them just skyrocketed out the gate and they were completely overvalued. And, and it was very clear to people who were in the industry that it was built on you know, hope and buzz and nothing substantiating it. A company like MedMen, um, they're, they're actually operating at a loss, or at least last I checked they were. Uh, meanwhile, they have you know, stores in New York and LA and Canada and they're painting this beautiful picture what they're really thinking of is the long term and, and where they're going to be in 10 years by securing this real estate and creating this brand. So you're looking at a false valuation. And I, th I think when people started to realize that the market was correcting itself and all these cannabis stocks are you know, just on a downward spiral right now, that's not to say that won't all come to fruition, but that's more of a long game um, and, and it's gonna take some time for that to, to come through. Yeah. I very well, very well said. Um, uh, to get back to your uh, question earlier, Virji, I, I think uh, we have three to five years until the really big players come in, uh, and and you know, uh, the large corporations will will then start to dominate this market. You know, drive prices down and um, basically push all the small small players out. Um, now, to your question, sir. Uh, I'm not a private equity invest, uh, sorry, a, a fund manager, um, but, uh, but we created a private equity fund uh, because we, 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 out of necessity, you know, we had to in order to fund our operations. Uh, so, you know, I, I think uh, in terms of uh, what our projected profits are for, for the grow, you know, we, we think we'll be able to uh, potentially double and triple investments within about a year. Um, I don't know what, what it is for other uh, cultivation operations. Um, and we're, we're starting a seed project soon as well. And again, we're going to see uh, tremendous ROI uh, in, in potentially all of these sectors uh, uh, in cannabis and hemp. Uh, but, uh, but there is volatility and there's a lot of risk. Uh, on the cultivation side, there's no there's no insurance. There's no federal insurance. Um, so if some, we had some farms uh, uh, around the U.S. today that uh, this year that had severe weather, um, you know, hail and it stripped them bare. So there's, you know, there's uh, really not much of a safety net, or really there's no safety net. So there will be volatility in this industry, uh, but uh, that's what drives the the crazy ROIs. Yeah, it's. I mean, we'll 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 start wrapping, but it's it is definitely a long term game. Um, if you look at this uh, in in positioning to where we think the market is going from a legalization standpoint, from a regulation standpoint, all these pieces will fit together. But it's it's not something that there's shorts that happen, but 
if you look at the way some of these larger companies, particularly companies like Constellation Brands, have gone deep with companies like Canopy, um, four and a half billion dollars, which was increased from 200 million of their initial investment. Um, there's some fallout. Their co-CEO got fired about two months ago um, because he was looking at the long vision. Constellation Brands putting four and a half billion dollars. They want to pull that profitability for forecast up a little bit. So, um, but. With that, thank you, everyone. Um, really, yeah. Oh. Uh, you touched on uh, you know, big farming, big farming, Wall Street, business, and you know, workforce. Basement farming. <laughs> <laughs> Pers <laughs> personal grows. <laughs> All right, that's a good topic to end on. That, that's <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, I, I know that many states do allow consumers to grow their own. Yeah. Uh, in California, I think you're allowed six plants. Yep. Um, and I think many states follow sort of a similar, uh, yeah. you know, method uh, and approach to it. So, you know, you're, you're allowed to grow a, a handful. I think New Jersey will also probably allow. If I I can speak to that specifically for New Jersey. So um, there are a lot of proponents for home grow, and it's something a lot of people were very disappointed that was left out of the bill. The main reason was um, probable cause. If a police officer is walking past your house and he smells marijuana, does he smell five plants or ten plants? You can't tell. So then what's the probable cause to search your home, and then you get into illegal searches? So that's really why we just want to get legalization across the line, and then I think home grow is something that's going to be dealt with as a phase two project. All right. With that. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. What, let's give them a hand. Thank you, Eric, Tara, Komal.